Howdy y'all. Like many my age, the first event that really got me into politics was the 2016 election, which is notable for, among other things, awarding the presidency to Donald Trump, despite his losing the popular vote. Since then, we've seen attacks on mail-in ballots, further pushing of voter ID laws, and an attempted coup. One of the greatest constants of my political life, and really US history as a whole, has been the right's non-stop attacks on the democratic process. So today, we'll be breaking down the ways conservatives attack voting rights. We'll be sourcing our arguments from the conservative media outlet, PragerU. Because one, they've got a lot of videos on these topics. Two, their many links with conservative media at large makes them a decent barometer for general right-wing thought on most issues. And three, their videos are short. That one's mostly for my benefit. Part 1. The Electoral College is literally the dumbest thing in the world. The biggest difference between elections in the United States compared to the rest of the world is the Electoral College. Rather than simply voting directly for the president during elections, US voters actually vote for electors, a slate of people put forward by each party in each state. Whichever party wins a majority of the state's vote, will get to send their entire group of electors to the Electoral College, except in Nebraska and Maine, where the distribution is more proportional. The number of electors given to each state is determined by that state's number of members of Congress, House and Senate. Once all the electors are assembled, they can cast the actual vote for president. Now, this is the kind of convoluted world building generally reserved for YA dystopian novels, and I think conservatives kind of rely on that inherent confusion when they're defending it. Because so many right-wing arguments don't make sense if you actually think about them. Let's take a look at probably the most common defense for the Electoral College. Because the system encourages coalition building and national campaigning. In order to win, a candidate must have the support of many different types of voters from various parts of the country. Winning only the South or the Midwest is not good enough. You cannot win 270 electoral votes if only one part of the country is supporting you. But if winning were only about getting the most votes, a candidate might concentrate all of his efforts in the biggest cities or the biggest states. Why would that candidate care about what people in West Virginia or Iowa or Montana think? Ah yes, the classic few big states or few big cities argument. Although the just win the South or Midwest argument is one you don't hear often, probably because those regions only make up about 40 and 20% of the country's population respectively. You know, not exactly a majority. But the big states big cities argument is actually pretty ubiquitous among the right, though it's equally laughable. For one, the US doesn't really have any cities that are particularly big. 8.5 million people live in New York City and while that may seem a lot, it's only about 2.5% of the country's total population. And after that, cities drop off fast. Los Angeles comes in second with less than 4 million, and you don't even get out of the top 10 before you're below even 1 million. Even if we were to be generous and use the total metro areas, the same applies. The 20 million strong New York City metro area accounts for 6% of the total US population. Compare that to something like the Paris metro area, which represents 16% of France, or the Tokyo metro area, which contains a whopping 32% of Japan's population. Also, note how even in these scenarios, the cities aren't a majority of a country. No nation of any considerable size is realistically going to be dominated by a single city. And as for the state's argument, we once again see the same thing with California's massive 39 million person population amounting to only about 12% of the total. Once again, we see a steep drop off, with Pennsylvania coming in fifth with less than 4%. If a candidate really wanted to win an election by focusing just on the big states, which is what conservatives claim popular vote allows, they'd need to win every vote in the top nine. Except that wouldn't happen. Because what we're ignoring here is that under a national popular vote, the concept of a state or a city voting as a monolith is just a lie. Because land doesn't vote. 
people do. And there is not one city in the country that is going to vote unanimously for one candidate. Even California, the right's go-to example of a supposed woke commie hellscape, gave 6 million votes to Donald Trump in 2020. Hell, PragerU themselves are based in California. You'd think they'd be a bit more aware of this. The only system under which this argument can make sense is, ironically, the Electoral College. Because under its winner-take-all approach, states actually are monolithic voting blocks. You could actually win under the Electoral College by getting just a slight majority in 12 states. If you vote for the losing party in your state, your opinion is not represented in the actual national election. Those 6 million California Republicans and 5 million Texas Democrats don't matter and haven't for decades. And this applies to every state. Down the board, millions of Americans might as well be casting their ballots right into a trash can. And while yes, even in a popular vote system, the voters for the losing side aren't represented by the winner, still, they get a much more direct say in the election. Their vote mattered just as much as everyone else's. Something we'll touch on more in a bit. And as for this idea that the Electoral College fosters coalition building and national campaigning, once again, they're just lying. Like, sure, anyone who's going to win a national election will need to form some sort of coalition, but there's nothing in particular about this system that boosts that. In fact, the winner-take-all system and lack of anything like ranked choice voting or a runoff election makes third parties essentially dead on arrival. So if anything, you're weakening the opportunities for coalition building. And the Electoral College isn't driving national campaigning either, because it really isn't that national of an election. The vast majority of states are pretty safe one way or another, and since once you get more than 50%, there's no point in gaining any more votes in a state, the candidates are incentivized not to dedicate their attention to every state equally, but rather just to the few states that have actual potential to flip year to year. That's why the vast majority of money and campaign visits goes to just a few states, and the majority of states never even receive a visit. Two of the states that PragerU claims this system helps, West Virginia and Montana, are among that group. Because under the Electoral College, they don't really matter. But you might ask, isn't the election really only about the so-called swing states? Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. Because it's, you know, true. Actually, no. If nothing else, safe and swing states are constantly changing. California voted safely Republican as recently as 1988. Texas used to vote Democrat. Neither New Hampshire nor Virginia used to be swing states. This is a deflection so embarrassing that if I wrote it, I'd delete my channel. The question on the table is, are swing states the only states that matter in any given election? And rather than explain why they're not, because they can't, they just say, no, swing states can change. And sure, over the course of several decades and election cycles, the states that are safe and the states that are swing have changed. But on an election-to-election -election basis, this is pretty meaningless. Do you think campaigns aren't doing research to try to identify which states have the greatest potential to swing? Because they are. And it's not even like they change particularly fast. Ohio has been a swing state for decades now. And I think any system that places the fate of the nation in the hands of Ohio is one that cannot be allowed to continue. But we all know the biggest problem with the Electoral College goes beyond Ohio, and that would be its capacity to elect a president who would have lost under a popular vote system. This is in part because the electoral votes are based on congressional seats. Since every state has an equal number of senators, States with smaller populations get far more influence in both the Senate and Electoral College, creating a system where your vote may be more or less valuable depending on where you live. Although, for PragerU, this blatant rejection of the idea that all people are created equal is a positive. Democracy has been colorfully described as two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner. In a pure democracy, fair majorities can easily tyrannize the rest of a country. Now, I'm not going to say there's nothing to the idea that democracy can be flawed. There's some issues I wouldn't love to put up to a national vote right now, 
but it's an overreach to say the Electoral College is a solution for those problems. For one, if you consider popular vote a tyranny of the majority, would the Electoral College not just be fostering the inverse, tyranny of the minority? They were just praising the supposed necessity to reach across the aisle, build coalitions, and appeal to everyone. But they'll throw that away because I guess we decided this losing share of voters is inherently more valuable based on where they live. And for as much as they say the system's about protecting minorities, the only minority it's protecting is the political minority. You know, Republicans. Groups such as racial, sexual, and gender minorities actually get pretty shafted under the Electoral College. For example, black voters overwhelmingly tend to vote Democrat. The states with the highest shares of black citizens are southern states, like Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. Despite this, the South is generally one of the greatest strongholds for the Republican Party. Because under the winner-take-all system, it often doesn't matter how black people vote. Because there's just more white people in the state. And obviously, we've seen some exceptions to this, such as recently in Georgia. But for the foreseeable future, more than half the nation's black population won't have much of a say in choosing the president. Because once again, the system isn't made to protect any minorities but the political one. Republicans, who, when in power, well, I guess they don't technically eat black people, women, and queer people, as far as I know, but they certainly fuck them over. The other group they claim this system helps is rural Americans, but it doesn't even do that. The most rural states in the country are also some of the safest racists every cycle so the candidates don't have any particular need to appeal to them, and consequently, these states are given next to no attention. Rural Americans may resent the flyover country label, but that's what the Electoral College renders them. The only group that benefits from this system is the Republican Party, and for all the high-minded idealism they espouse, that's the only reason PragerU and conservatives work so hard to defend it. There's one more point they make in favor of the Electoral College, and it's a weird one. The Electoral College also makes it harder to steal elections. Votes must be stolen in the right state in order to change the outcome of the Electoral College. With so many swing states, this is hard to predict and hard to do. But without the Electoral College, any vote stolen in any precinct in the country could affect the national outcome even if that vote was easily stolen in the bluest California precinct or the reddest Texas one. There's a lot wrong with this, but let's start with the fact that, like, even if you're assuming votes are regularly being stolen by some shadowy cabal, they'd have an easier time of it under the Electoral College. Like, making up several million votes would be objectively harder than making up, say, 100,000 across a couple key swing states which aren't impossible to predict, like PragerU seems so eager to believe. Now, there's a big problem with this reasoning, and that's the fact that we're starting under the assumption that stealing votes or voter fraud are a serious issue, widespread enough to shape elections. And this is a frequent talking point among the right. Attempting to delegitimize the results of elections they don't like is deeply embedded in the reactionary mind, and it has been since the beginning. Part 2 the Voter Fraud Fraud Wow, that sounds like a best-selling book, huh? If any publishers want to reach out, my email is Doki Doki. In his book, Give Us the Ballot, journalist Ari Berman details the history of the Voting Rights Act. The book covers several attempts to interfere with and overturn election results, but the one that stuck out to me most was a 1966 campaign between Wilson Baker and Jim Clark for Sheriff of Selma, Alabama. Both of these candidates were segregationists, but Clark was far more hardline about it, leading the newly enfranchised black population to overwhelmingly back Baker. As the results were coming in, it became clear that Baker was set to win outright, but Clark devised a way to force a runoff election, going to the Democratic Executive Committee and convincing them to throw away six boxes of votes, mostly from black voters, under the reasoning that they were infected with irregularities and not valid ballots. This would ultimately fail for Clark, with the court finding no evidence of fraud. But the strategy would not disappear. 54 years later, we'd see Donald Trump's campaign attempting to pull the same crap in Michigan, 
targeting predominantly black voters in Detroit. The campaign filed several lawsuits alleging fraud, boosted claims of fake votes being brought in, and attempted to exclude votes from Wayne, Washtenaw, and Ingham counties, which, Alex fact, is the county I live in and the counties I've gone to school in. It's like they custom tailored the coup to make me feel appreciated. All these measures would wind up failing, but they were still instrumental in helping the right convince their base that the system was rigged against them. An attitude that would eventually culminate in an attempted insurrection, and an attitude PragerU has been trying to cultivate for a long time. While the major media fixates on the influence of foreign powers on American elections, a much more serious attack has been taking place right under our noses. Good old-fashioned, homegrown voter fraud. Let's look at three of the worst offenses. So, as we saw in 2020, voter fraud is supposedly a dire enough issue to be worth staking an entire campaign on. So, what exactly are these examples of voter fraud? We're gonna go in reverse order, because it works better for the structure of the video. Lil, peek behind the curtains for you there. Voter corruption example number three, voting by non-citizens. Whoa, non-citizens voting, you say? Has PragerU uncovered some hidden agenda of millions of undocumented immigrants showing up to the polls under false identities to vote for an agenda of critical race theory and gender ideology? Well, not exactly. According to a recent poll, more than half of Democrats, 53%, support granting illegal immigrants the right to vote. Forget the legal ones. Okay, so that's not voter fraud. That's just an opinion poll on support for the enfranchisement of undocumented immigrants. Even if said immigrants were granted the right to vote in federal elections, that still wouldn't be fraud. It'd just be voting. And spoiler alert, it's probably not happening anyways. Because a policy having slightly over majority support among Democrat voters means next to nothing for said policy actually getting enacted. 85% of Democrats support tuition-free college, and all the Biden administration was able to accomplish was an act that would forgive up to $20,000 in student loan debt for borrowers. A very good, if incomplete, piece of policy that was then almost immediately struck down by the Supreme Court. Aside aside, PragerU does later point to some concrete evidence of non-citizens voting. It's true that federal law prohibits non-citizens from voting in federal elections, but 11 states, all run by Democrats, currently allow non-citizen voting of some kind. Cities such as Chicago and San Francisco, for example, allow non-citizens to vote in certain citywide elections. Okay, so once again, that isn't voter fraud. Like, regardless of if you like these policies, the video is called is voter fraud real? And they're just pointing at groups of people voting legally and saying, well, I don't think that should be allowed. I worry I'm being unfair. Maybe they just couldn't think of a third example. I'm sure example two is a real heavy hitter. Tell you what, if I never upload this video, then you'll know example two was really convincing. Here's example number two, ballot harvesting. Okay, so here they're talking about the practice of having a third party deliver votes on behalf of others with those voters' permission. This can be helpful for some, such as the elderly, the disabled, those who work, or just anyone who can't make it to the polls. Now, the claim from PragerU is that there's nothing to stop these third parties from messing with the ballots. And by extension, surely this must be a widespread example of fraud. But this isn't accurate. First off, there are protections. Obviously. And because of this, we have very few examples of any sort of tampering or fraud occurring as a result of this collection, with what examples conservatives can point to often being laughably unsubstantiated or not actually being examples of ballot harvesting. PragerU avoids making this mistake by not actually pointing to examples, and instead just talking about election results. Let's look at one specific example. On election night in 2018, California Central Valley Republican Congressman David Valadeo held a 5,000 vote lead over his challenger, Democrat T.J. Cox. The margin was wide enough that the networks even called the race for Valadeo, the Republican incumbent. But wait, there were late ballots still to be delivered by the third party vote harvesters. When those votes came in, they broke so overwhelmingly for Cox in a historically conservative district, no less, that Valadeo's 5,000 vote victory 
became an 862 vote loss. Maybe that was just a coincidence, or maybe not. In the first major election after ballot harvesting was allowed in California, Democrats won every single congressional seat in Orange County, which had been a Republican stronghold for decades. A year earlier, no sober person would have thought that possible. Okay, so PragerU's argument that ballot harvesting is a serious source of fraud relies not on any, you know, examples of that, but rather us believing that these election results from 2018 are so unbelievable, there simply had to have been foul play. So are they that unbelievable? Well, with the benefit of hindsight, having seen the 2020 election, I think we can write off the incredulity that late ballots favored Dems. That's just typically how it's gone. It's not a sign of fraud, it's just how the party's bases prefer to vote relative to each other. If Republicans didn't want their base to avoid absentee and mail-in ballots, they wouldn't spend so much time demonizing them. As for the notion the Cox district was unwinnable by a Democrat, while it's true the district was historically conservative, that control seems to have been waning, with the past few wins coming by decreasing margins. I'd also point to the district's demographics being a factor. The 21st district, where this election took place, had a majority Hispanic population, and I don't think it's a stretch to say that some of Donald Trump's policies and rhetoric may have been alienating to that voter base, for some reason, which could have hurt Republicans running in districts with large Hispanic populations. The other thing that's important to consider is that this race is in line with the larger trend that saw many seats flipped in favor of Democrats, as this was a midterm in which the party that lost the presidency historically sees more wins. And following this election, 2020 would see the seat return to Republican control by a one-point margin. It's a similar story when we look to Orange County. PragerU says that the county going all blue was inconceivable, but that's not exactly true. Orange County had also been shifting away from being a conservative stronghold, due in part to its growing Asian and Hispanic populations. Two of the Republican incumbents had retired rather than run for re-election, weakening the party's hold on those seats, and a third incumbent seemed pretty close to Russia, giving the Democrats some pretty easy ammunition to attack him with. Taken with the larger blue wave, it's not crazy that four seats could have flipped, especially when you factor in Mike Bloomberg spending millions in advertisements on these races in the last few weeks. And like with the Cox example, this wasn't some permanent shift. In the next election, two of the seats flipped right back. What PragerU is doing here is pointing at California having a couple seats flip blue in a good year for Democrats and saying, this must be because of their ballot harvesting, ignoring the rest of the country which largely followed this same trend without any changes in their laws. And once again, I have to point out they still haven't shown an example of voter fraud in their video is voter fraud real? They got a bit closer, I guess, but they're still relying on the viewer to take the mental leap that because they've been presented a suspicious election result, that fraud must have occurred, rather than the more simple conclusion that PragerU is just omitting some facts. So if the second two examples weren't actually examples of voter fraud, is the first? No. Example number one, bloated voter rolls. In 244 counties across the United States, there are more registered voters than there are people legally eligible to vote. 29 states have counties with more registered voters than legal residents, and eight states have more registered voters than actual voting age people. Now, it's true that many voter registration records are inaccurate. This isn't some malicious election rigging thing, rather just the result of having a huge number of people in the country, making record keeping difficult, especially as these systems continue to be shifted from analog to digital. PragerU also pulls another sneaky omission with this one, when they proudly spout some statistics from Pew Research. 24 million voter registrations in the United States are either invalid or significantly inaccurate, and nearly 3 million people are believed to be registered to vote in more than one state. Now, these are some quite concerning numbers. And you know who else thought that? Most state governments, eight years before this PragerU video was published. 
because this report came out in 2012, and since then, despite no mention of it from Prager, most states have taken at least some actions to try to help keep their records up to date, such as joining with the Electronic Registration Resource Center, or ERIC, an organization with 26 member states and DC that uses voter rolls, DMV records, and death certificates to help update voter information, as well as other functions such as driving voter registration. So here's a program that addresses the concerns Republicans supposedly have with this system. Not perfectly, of course. I personally prefer the automatic voter registration systems in use in a couple states, since they're able to keep the voter rolls better updated, while also registering even more people to vote. But Eric is alright, and was fairly bipartisan, as it had an equal number of Republican and Democratic states as members. I say had, because in 2022, the right decided it was bad all of a sudden, claiming it was funded by George Soros. The boogeyman, which the right hates for unspecified reasons that definitely have nothing to do with him being Jewish. Despite the claims being wrong, as none of Soros' money had ever gone to Eric, Republican member states began withdrawing en masse, additionally citing their disapproval of Eric requiring member states to encourage unregistered voters to register, a horrifying prospect to conservatives for reasons we'll get into later. Now, before cleaning up voter rolls got cast aside in the interest of wider culture war pissery, why was the right harping on it as such a major issue? These numbers have a shocking implication. It's very easy to exploit our voting system. During an undercover investigation, New York City detectives made 63 attempts to cast illegal ballots based on flawed voter rolls. They were successful 61 times. Similar investigations in other cities and other states produce the same dismal results. Now, to answer the question on everyone's mind, no, this isn't an actual instance of voter fraud. The report they cite says as much itself, but this is still a potential insecurity, even if they don't actually provide any of these investigations in other cities and states, opting instead to list their own videos in the sources three times. But I'm a generous god, so I'll take it on their non-existent goodwill that these other investigations did all produce similar results. Would this potential for exploitation then mean that our electoral system is rife with fraud? No, it still wouldn't, because of the point that PragerU has been dancing around this whole video. The reason they have to point at potential insecurities, misleadingly framed election results, and opinion polls in the video, Is Voter Fraud Real?, instead of just pointing towards examples of actual voter fraud, is because voter fraud is a practically non-existent crime. Let's delve into some basic economics here. We're going to perform a cost-benefit analysis for committing voter fraud. So, if you commit voter fraud, you'd be facing up to five years in prison, felon status, which in some states can lose you your right to vote entirely, and a $10,000 fine, with potentially even more state penalties. By contrast, you stand to gain one additional vote, which, as we covered earlier, might not even matter. It's simply not worth it to bother trying to commit voter fraud. And it's for this reason that even in the few cases where somebody does, it's often done by mistake. They just don't realize they're breaking the law. And I should note that, like with most elements of our justice system, there's often significant racial bias in the enforcement of our voter fraud penalties. But regardless of any inequalities in the punishment, it's been clear in election after election that voter fraud does not occur to anywhere near a meaningful extent. Even if we're looking at voting by mail, which PragerU considers the voting method most vulnerable to potential fraud, at least if we're going by their video, How to Steal an Election, Mail-in Ballots, there's only a 0.0025% rate of potential fraud. Not confirmed, just potential. So the real rate would be even lower. The possibility of voter fraud occurring in a US election is akin to the possibility that if you flip a coin, it will land perfectly on its side. Is it a technical possibility? Sure, but it's so vastly unlikely to the extent that on the immense scale that is US federal elections, it will never have anywhere near a significant impact. And if you're thinking, oh, this isn't a fair analogy, you're right, 
it's not. Cause the coin flip thing is six and a half times more likely than even the highest reputable estimates for potential voter fraud. The reason the right makes such a massive deal out of voter fraud is not because they actually think it's a real threat. They know it's not as well as we do. But by driving focus towards supposed threats to our election security, conservatives are able to more easily pass laws which ostensibly are meant to increase that security, but in reality serve more to limit the amount of people voting, particularly the amount of poor and or non-white people voting. Part 3. Taking away the vote. The most obvious modern example of this is the push for increased photo ID requirements in order to vote. 36 states now have some form of ID requirements, and Republicans are always pushing to increase that number and make existing laws more strict. The earliest voter ID laws date back to 1950, becoming more common in the decades following the Voting Rights Act, and really exploding in popularity in the 21st century, particularly after 2013, when the Supreme Court delivered a ruling in Shelby County v. Hoyer that gutted the Voting Rights Act removing Section 5, which required that in states with a history of passing racist voting laws, any future voting laws would need to be vetted to make sure they weren't also racist. By removing this, the court was essentially preventing the act from ever being enforced. The very next day, Texas would start plans to implement its own photo ID law, and several more states have followed in the years since. The reasoning behind these laws is fairly simple. Non-white people are just statistically less likely to have these forms of ID. According to a survey by NYU's Brennan Center for Justice in 2006, the time when these laws were starting to really gain steam, 25% of black citizens lacked government-issued photo ID compared to just 8% of whites. The elderly and those with low incomes were also less likely to have ID. These disparities are further heightened by discriminatory implementation and enforcement of these laws. Several states have passed laws that don't accept forms of ID more likely to be owned by black voters, such as the defunct North Carolina law that did not accept public assistance or state employee ID cards, or the Texas law which doesn't accept student ID cards. Whenever these laws are called into question by the left for their readily apparent racial motivation, Rather than actually defending the laws, Republicans, without fail, return to the same tired, thought-terminating cliché. Yet the accusers say that conservatives who support voter ID are racist. Why do they say this? Because, they argue, it's really a ruse to prevent blacks and other minorities from voting, since many of them just aren't capable of acquiring an ID. Can you get more condescending than that? This is the most insufferable argument ever. It attempts to shift the discussion from whether these laws are discriminatory to one of the competency of black voters, hoping to shut up liberals out of fear of being perceived as racist. I've already done an entire video on this argument, so I'll link that if you want an in-depth explanation. The bare bones of it is that while people are theoretically able to acquire an ID should the need arise, though conservatives love to brush over the time, money, and travel commitment needed to obtain even a free ID. These laws shouldn't exist because they don't actually fix anything. Like we covered, voter fraud, the ostensible reason these laws exist, is not a threat to US elections. So by implementing them, you don't actually fix anything, and instead just create an additional barrier to voting for a group of people that is disproportionately non-white. And the more hurdles you put in the way of voting, the less likely one is to vote. Can black people without a photo ID obtain one and vote despite these laws? Yes, but conservatives are relying on a significant chunk of them not doing so. And even if they do, conservatives will just use that as further reasoning for why their laws aren't discriminatory. The black voter turnout rate for the most part has grown steadily since the 1990s. This has occurred notwithstanding an increase in state voter ID requirements over the same period. It seems likely to me that this claim is using nationwide data rather than state-by-state -state data, although I unfortunately can't say where these numbers are from, because if you go to the source listed for this claim, it leads to a Wall Street Journal article that is literally just the script of this video. I'm used to prayer use citing themselves, 
but I'm not sure if I've ever seen them just literally cite the video itself. Truly mind-boggling levels of academic incompetence. Regardless, black voter turnout increasing wouldn't necessarily mean these laws have no impact. For starters, you can't take numbers on a national level because the laws only impact their given state. But even if a state with voter ID laws saw an increase in turnout, it still wouldn't be a sign these laws aren't impacting people's ability to vote. When comparing voter turnout between states with and without voter ID laws, even when voter ID states record increases in turnout, those increases often lag behind the increases in turnout of non-ID states. This would indicate that the turnout increase is a national trend that's being limited to an extent by voter ID laws, rather than these laws not preventing anyone from voting. Additionally, voting trends are often very reactive. In Give Us the Ballot, Berman describes several instances in which black voter registration drives in the 50s and 60s would see their progress outpaced by white voter registration drives organized to counter the growing political power of the black population. It's not difficult to imagine that conservative attacks on minority voting rights could be a motivating factor in increasing black voter turnout. In fact, it's a fairly common rallying point for Democratic organizers in get out the vote pushes. All this to say that racist laws don't become not racist just because they didn't work as well as intended. And of course, it doesn't stop with voter ID laws. So much of conservative electoral strategy seems to come down to preventing people from voting. They oppose mail-in voting, which makes voting easier for millions of people who would otherwise have difficulty getting to the polls. They often rail against early voting, which is also helpful for many people, especially because election day is on a Tuesday for some reason. And even when people are voting in person on election day, the right seeks to make it as difficult as possible. Many states, such as Georgia, have been closing polling places in spite of rapidly growing numbers of voters. And while polls are closing everywhere, it's not hard to notice that they tend to close more often in predominantly black neighborhoods. This results in voters having to wait in line for hours after the polls close, because the number of voters is intentionally too high for the polling places to effectively handle. All of this taken together leads to a conclusion that is pretty obvious but still feels like we don't acknowledge it nearly enough. Part 4. Conservatives just straight up hate democracy. Now, this may seem like a pretty strong claim, but conservatives say it themselves. A lot. We should not go along with those who today are demanding constitutional changes simply because this or that institution or procedure established by the Constitution, say the Senate or the Electoral College, is not democratic. More democratic doesn't necessarily mean better. It doesn't necessarily mean more just. Our founders understood this. So should we. Generally, when confronted with the reality of American electoralism having some fairly undemocratic elements, conservatives will retreat to this, well, we aren't a democracy. We're a republic, argument before launching into some rant about how direct democracy is bad or whatever. This is a pretty silly response. It's one of those rebuttals where you argue against the point you wish someone was making, rather than the one they actually are. Because direct democracy, whatever its merits or downsides, isn't what people are talking about when they say the Electoral College is undemocratic. Generally, they're saying that the supposed representative democracy is unrepresentative of the actual voters. That's why their proposal to fix it is national popular vote and not everyone voting on every bill. Additionally, being a representative democracy doesn't make a country not a republic. They aren't mutually exclusive terms. There's one bit of the PragerU video that stands out to me though. They lean really heavily on the idea that the Founding Fathers really didn't want democracy. Our Founders understood this, so should we. Now, conservatives often lean on the supposed genius of the Founding Fathers when defending their political positions treating them with the same reverential infallibility they usually reserve for Jesus. This is dumb and blatantly ignores that many of the founders saw themselves as highly fallible and viewed the constitution as a living document rather than a list of holy commandments. But PragerU has stumbled ass backwards into an accurate point here. 
Because they're right in saying that many of the founders did not want democracy. Because anti-democratic pushes in US politics date back to its founding. For the most obvious example of this, uh, I don't know if this is common knowledge, but most people weren't allowed to vote until the 20th century. Obviously, women and non-white people weren't, but there was also the issue of white men without property. At the country's founding, there was a worry that if only property owners were allowed to vote, they may oppress the people. But if everyone was allowed to vote, they may oppress the property owners. So to solve this problem, they only let people with property vote. Now, you may notice this isn't actually solving the supposed problem. It's just deferring power to the wealthy. Keep that in mind. It's going to come up later. Now, all these other groups of people weren't allowed to vote. But that doesn't mean they had no influence on the electoral process. Because the number of representatives each state has in the House is determined by their population in the census. And votes in the Electoral College are determined by a state's number of members of Congress. And while they weren't permitted to vote, women and white men without property were counted in the census. And critically, enslaved people were counted in the census, and three-fifths of their population was put towards their state's total for determining that state's congressional power. Meaning that enslaved individuals were increasing the voting power of their enslavers. Herger Yu, of course, views the three-fifths compromise as a powerful anti-slavery policy, reasoning that, well, it could have been worse. By the time of the Civil War, the slave population had grown to four million. Imagine how much more powerful slave states would have been without the three-fifths compromise. Like, yes, three-fifths is less than a whole. We're really good at math around these parts. But the compromise still puts undeserved power into the hands of enslavers. It's not anti-slavery. It's, at the very best, a neutral position between slavery is bad and slavery is cool and based, actually. And to pretend this is some big win for abolitionism is stupid. Pergu's main defense for the compromise was that it was necessary to help form a stable union. Why, you might ask, didn't the North simply insist that the South not count slaves at all? Because the slave states would never have agreed to join the Union. There's a problem with this assertion, however. Because the Three-Fifths Compromise, notably, did not lead to a stable union. No stable union could have ever been formed, no matter the compromise. The entire history of early American politics consisted of compromise after compromise that would grant protections to the institution of slavery in the southern states. And even so, the South still seceded at the first inkling of a possibility of a real threat to the future of slavery. Lincoln didn't run on abolition or anything. They just knew he didn't like slavery, and that was enough. And following emancipation, we would see another example of right-wing attacks on voting, as the 15th Amendment, which granted voting rights to African American men, was barely around long enough for the ink to dry before people were hard at work subverting those rights, instituting poll taxes and literacy tests that ostensibly applied to everyone, but were designed to prevent African Americans specifically from voting, with white voters being afforded grandfather clauses and laxer testing procedures. If a law designed to reduce the number of black voters while on paper not having any racial bias sounds familiar, yeah, modern voter ID laws parallel Jim Crow era policy fairly well. The right is seemingly only creative when it comes to finding new ways to stop people from voting. Later, some of the biggest voices against women's suffrage would be conservative women. The idea that some conservatives would support stripping away even their own voting rights seems absurd at first. But given some of the movement's roots in the pro-monarchy side of the French Revolution, it makes a bit more sense. As long as the hierarchy is maintained, it doesn't really matter if one personally votes in a conservative leader. Of course, no matter how much the right may oppose democracy in practice, you're not likely to hear them just come out and say so. There are certainly some who do, just look at Nick Fuentes. Or, better yet, don't. But you're not likely to see the typical Reaganite Republicans say, it's about time we return to monarchy. There's a couple reasons for this. 
For starters, it'd be massively unpopular. No matter how many attacks the right launches on voting rights, no matter how much they try to twist electoral systems in their favor, the idea of democracy remains popular. That's why, when defending Israel, PragerU says it's more democratic than its neighbors. And when defending capitalism, PragerU says it's more democratic than socialism, because you can vote with your dollar. Which is stupid, because when you vote with your dollar, people with more dollars get more votes. But it doesn't matter if their claims make sense. They're not saying capitalism is inherently democratic because they actually believe it. To right-wing politicians and media, democracy is just another fun buzzword to toss around, like freedom, wokeness, and family values. But there's another, simpler reason why conservatives rarely attack democracy outright. They don't need to. The right is able to succeed by working within and around the system. It helps that the system itself isn't perfectly democratic. It doesn't matter if they can't win the support of a majority, because they don't need that to win the Senate or presidency. And even though the House of Representatives is more proportional, it can easily be shifted in their favor through the use of gerrymandering, or drawing congressional districts in order to ensure an unrepresentative advantage. Republican gerrymandering strategy parallels pretty much all of their efforts to ensure an unfair advantage on Election Day, as it primarily seeks to reduce the impact of black voters. This most famously occurred in North Carolina, where maps of the state's black population were used to draw districts that corralled almost all of the state's black voters into just a few districts, severely limiting the reach of their votes. And while these maps were eventually struck down as a racial gerrymander, that didn't stop conservatives in the state from using maps of the state's partisan lean to draw a map that achieved the exact same result. There's also the matter of corporate lobbying of politicians, which gives us the capitalistic ideal of democracy, where political influence is determined by the deepness of one's pockets. Many have noted how the US is functionally an oligarchy, where powerful lobbies, such as those for oil, guns, healthcare, tech, and defense manufacturing, are able to purchase enough influence in Congress that they are unlikely to ever face any meaningful regulation. PragerU, itself a product of oil money, thinks this is awesome, as indicated by their video, Money in Politics? What's the problem? Where they waffle on for five minutes about why corporate lobbying is speech, and because it's speech, the government should stop collecting taxes. I'm not joking. The only constitutional way to reduce the amount of money invested in politics is to reduce the role of politics in the distribution of money. Absolute galaxy brain take right there. But of course, there is one exception to their pro-lobbying stance, union. You see, PragerU considers it a conflict of interest that unions can give money and manpower to help with the candidate's campaign. When that very same candidate, if elected, will then be in charge of passing laws relating to the union. This is different than with corporate lobbying, because, uh, well, Prairie U just doesn't like it when workers are able to exercise power rather than it being concentrated solely in the hands of their corporate overlords. And of course, we only have such a problem with lobbying because of the Citizens United ruling delivered by the right's favorite tool for subverting democracy, the courts. Conservatives have made no secret of their reliance on the courts, with their focus on loading up the Supreme and Appellate Courts, giving them several big wins in recent history. The Supreme Court is by far the least democratic of the three branches of government, with members not being elected by the people, but rather nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate, which, if you've been paying attention up to this point, you'll recognize as a triple layer shit sandwich of how to make a vote not reflect the actual will of the electorate. And once they're in, justices face no real chance of being forced out. With no re-election, they're free to serve until they retire or die. And that day never seems to come fast enough for some of them. So the court is permitted to act as a check on the power of the president, Congress, and the basic rights of minority groups, without much in the way of balancing them. And apparently, they're just allowed to take bribes? Like, seriously. How is this Clarence Thomas shit not a bigger deal? Even when they can manipulate the system in their favor, conservatives do still lose. 
being incredibly unpopular and comically evil will do that. And when that happens, their true colors are often revealed such as Donald Trump's attempts to overturn the results of the 2020 election and his supporters and many of his fellow party members backing him in that cause to the extent of storming the Capitol to kill their opponents. Honestly, it feels like I've put more effort into demonstrating conservatives' proclivity for dictatorship than they put into hiding it. Ultimately, is there anything we can do with this information besides just kinda getting bummed out about it? Part 5. What do? It's clear that the very fundamentals of U.S. democracy are in jeopardy due to conservatives doing everything they can to subvert it. But I think it's also clear at this point that the very fundamentals of U.S. democracy themselves are also deeply flawed. From the start of this country, the will of the people has been deprioritized as those in power sought a compromise between true representative democracy and maintaining the rule of the rich and powerful generally opting to side with the rule of the rich and powerful. So we're left to ask, is there any chance of changing this system for the better? On the legislative level, gerrymandering needs to be fixed. But I'm wary about mostly Democrat-leaning states being the ones to institute policies to address it. It makes sense for the more Sweeney states to pass anti-gerrymandering measures now, as that would allow them to better reflect their true electorate rather than just whatever political party happened to be in power during redistricting. My home state of Michigan had a really bad partisan gerrymander for the past decade, but in 2018, we voted to establish an independent redistricting commission, and now our new maps are pretty good. This makes sense for a state like Michigan, where neither party really has a stronghold. But say a safely dem state implements the same policy. Their new map, while still producing mostly Democrat-leaning districts, may create a few toss-up or Republican-leaning districts where they otherwise wouldn't have existed. In theory, this is how it's supposed to work. The districts better reflect the voters within the state. But this only works if Republican-controlled states do the same. Otherwise, the conservatives retain their gerrymandered advantage, while the liberals lose theirs, shifting the balance of power to the right. To best work, we'd need anti-gerrymandering policy on the federal level. And luckily, we have some. The Freedom to Vote Act, introduced by Senator Amy Klobuchar. This act bans partisan gerrymandering, creates some protections against racial gerrymandering, and makes it easier to challenge maps in court. The act is by no means perfect. It still leaves the drawing of maps up to the states, when ideally you'd establish independent redistricting commissions everywhere. Because even when they're not allowed to partisan gerrymander, if politicians get to draw the maps, they're gonna partisan gerrymander. But still, it's a step in the right direction. A bipartisan compromise like those favored by our nation's founders. And like the compromises of the founders, it didn't work, even the slightest bit, as the act failed on the roll call vote with every Republican and Chuck Schumer voting against it. The fact that the Democratic Party is so often unable to get all the politicians within its own party to agree on legislation, let alone flipping any Republican politicians, makes it very easy to be pessimistic about the possibility of positive change. Whether you attribute this lack of party cohesion to varying interests, rotating villain theory, the influence of lobbying, or something else, doesn't matter. The results are the same. In an ideal world, something would be done about the Senate. It doesn't make sense for a representative body to give so much more or less representation to the citizens based on what state they live in. But to do this, you would need the Senate to agree to reform itself. It doesn't take a genius to realize that's unlikely to happen. It would be nice to see the emergence of viable third parties and stuff like rate choice voting, but because of America's first past the post system, Voting third party can often mean helping the major party you identify with the least gain power. So there's not really a route to making a third party viable on a national scale. And I don't think either of the major parties is rushing to give themselves more competition. The Electoral College is a garbage system designed to give more of a vote to slaveholders. It doesn't make sense today, but it's not going anywhere anytime soon. That's not to say there's been no attempts. Richard Nixon tried to get rid of it in the 60s with a constitutional amendment, but was ultimately filibustered by a group of Southern senators 
using the same few big states argument that's been around since. With the amendment path seemingly impossible to achieve, an alternative emerged in the 21st century. The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is an agreement between state governments to award their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote, regardless of the outcome within their own state. This would functionally give the US a popular vote system, but it's also seemingly improbable. The agreement only goes into place when enough states have signed on to reach the 270 mark. And while plenty have signed on, the agreement has been stalled out at about 75% of the votes needed for a few years now. I don't see it reaching that goal anytime soon. And the second it does, it seems likely it will immediately be struck down by the Supreme Court, which serves as the primary obstacle to any attempts to change our system for the better. The court also serves as a good example for how Democrats shouldn't act when in a position of power. For starters, if the party hopes to influence any sort of positive change, they cannot simply rely on taking the high road. When it came time for Obama to replace a Supreme Court justice in 2016, the conservative Senate famously blocked his candidate, not even allowing a vote to be held. And while it's controversial, there is an argument to be made that Obama could have gone around the Senate and appointed his justice as the Senate had failed to do their job. Instead, he refused to lower himself even slightly to the level of his Republican opponents, and valiantly held his head up high and did nothing. This may have worked out for the best, maintaining a respectful image and ultimately getting their justice on the court, if the Democrats had won the 2016 election. Instead, they let the right steal a judicial appointment, and now Neil Gorsuch will be on the court until he dies in 2050 or something. Speaking of death, it also might have helped if Ruth Bader Ginsburg had retired while there was still a Democrat in the presidency to replace her. The liberal tendency towards high-minded idealism in the face of backhanded political schemery didn't wind up protecting the right to an abortion. The US is now facing decades of a conservative court largely put into place by the dubiously legal actions of Senate Republicans and the election of a president most of the country never wanted in the first place. There isn't much to do about it outside of literally just waiting for old people to die. Unless Democrats are willing to be aggressive too. If the system is broken, go ahead and break it right back. I know court packing is very controversial, but so is overturning abortion, which they did. And they're gonna roll back every single gain made by any minority group, unless they're stopped. Opponents of packing will often say, well, what if Republicans win the next election and immediately rig the system back in their favor? And you're left to wonder, what do they mean if? The right has been playing aggressive this whole time. Democrats cannot afford to simply adhere to this ideal of proper conduct, or they're just gonna keep getting suckered. Of course, this has so far failed to stir many members of the party. The DNC isn't watching my videos, and it's clear that if any changes to occur, it will need to emerge from the ground up. I know that some people are gonna roll their eyes when I say it's important to vote, particularly when I've spent the previous hour outlining all the systems in place to ensure their vote counts for as little as possible. But there is still some value in voting, particularly on the state and local level. Things might not get better if you vote, but they can only get worse if you don't. Of course, it's by no means enough to just vote straight ticket Democrat. It's becoming increasingly apparent the party establishment is insufficient. So go ham, back progressive challengers, Become a progressive challenger if you're able. With the electoral system being set up to make third parties unviable, the best bet is just changing the Democratic Party into something better. On August 2nd, 2023, as I'm writing this, PragerU asked its followers, what should the voting age be? And all their fans came out to say it should be raised to 21, 25, 30 even. And while this seems to be just the same old conservative attacks on democracy, seeking to restrict voting only to the people that support them. I think there's something more to it. Young people have always trended progressive relative to the general voting population. But not only are today's youth seemingly more progressive than ever before, but they appear to be subverting a crucial trend. They're not really trending too far conservative as they age. In previous generations, with somewhat stable economic performance, 
As people aged and accumulated wealth and property, many were liable to take an approach of, fuck you, I've got a duplex, I want tax cuts for the ultra wealthy now. But as they reckon with the increasingly unstable nature of life under capitalism, which failed to deliver on their promised future and has kept them largely in debt, millennials and Zoomers aren't off getting their own duplexes. And their political trends reflect that. There is still a shift towards conservatism. My guess is that turning 40 just breaks something in your brain. Sorry to the 10% of my audience that's over 40, I'm sure all of your brains are fine. But even when they shift to the right, millennials are still more left-leaning than previous generations were at the same age. Young people today are a threat like never before, and the right sees this. That's why organizations like PragerU are so desperate to brainwash kids into their ideology. They know if they can't get their hands on the youth, then it's either change to suit the shifting attitudes of the nation or get left behind. This is why I don't see America as a lost cause yet. No matter how fucked up the foundation, the potential to change for the better is still there. American democracy is broken. Conservatives have been fighting for 250 years to keep it that way. But there's never been a better time to fight back. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Check out my other channels and donate to my Patreon, where you can get your name in the credits like these lovely individuals, including my $10 and up patrons, Yearning to Fly, and Amy Gleixner. Thanks for all the continued support on the channel. It's been honestly kind of overwhelming to have so many people reach out to me to tell me they like my stuff. I like it though. For someone who makes such politically focused content, it's shocking to me how little negative attention I seem to get. Also, I know it's only August, but if you have anything you'd like me to talk about for this year's Halloween video, I'd love to hear it. I have a couple ideas, but I'm not sure about any of them yet, and I absolutely refuse to let an opportunity to wear my costume on camera pass me by. See ya!